So hello, everyone. Welcome to this webinar on blockchain and cryptocurrencies. I'm your host, Ashley Mateos from the Carl Schwartz House. For those of you who don't know, the Carl Schwartz House is the German American Institute in Freiburg, Germany. We offer a diverse cultural program, English language courses for all ages, and we also have a vibrant all English library. We are a nonprofit institute supported in part by our members. The main goal of the Carl Schwartz House is to facilitate transatlantic discourse across all areas, ranging from literature to politics to business, which brings us here this evening. In addition to coordinating the English language courses for adults at the Carl Schwartz House and in companies, I'm also head of our German American business community. We provide events centered around transatlantic business relations, professional development, and networking. Here with me tonight are David and Daniel, and they will explain, illuminate, and advise us this evening on all things Web3, including blockchain and cryptocurrencies. Uh, so let me tell you a little bit more about our guests here this evening. We have David Lopez-Kurtz. He is an attorney at Dinsmore & Scholl LLP, which is a US-based law firm. Uh, and he's also the founder of BSL Group, where they guide innovators and organizations in building the future of Web3. David has a background in law, fintech, and Web3, and has also multitudes of other interests. Daniel Notto, also here with us this evening, is a business intelligence consultant at Novo Factum GmbH. Uh, that's actually one of our newest JBC members here in Freiburg. And Daniel has a background in data analysis and business analytics. And he's uh, even co-authored a book on cryptocurrencies and accounting in the Dach region, that's the German-Austria-Swiss region. So now that we know a little bit more about our guest speakers this evening, let's just dive right in, shall we? Uh, I think we're all here to learn tonight. My own interest in the subject was piqued last year after I read an article in Forbes about Web3. And I have an assistant this evening, her name is Joanna. Uh, she's going to drop in some useful links and info into the chat for me as we go. Uh, these links will be uploaded loaded to the YouTube channel later if you're watching via YouTube. If you're joining us via Zoom tonight, again, as I said, please feel free to interact and send us your questions in the chat. All right, so let's get started with uh, a bit of an overview. That way we can ease into things. Uh, I have some slides here that Daniel has prepared and I've also added on to myself. Uh, but Daniel and David, please chime in where necessary. We'll start this off as a bit of an overview, and then we'll get into some more um, successful implementations, use cases, talking about how it works for business, and so on. So we'll kick things off with a little screen share here. All right. So here's a bit of an overview for anybody who is kind of new to this subject area, such as myself. Uh, the internet appeared around the 1970s and then in 1990s it became the web. As of 1995, that is actually where we have web 1.0 and that's probably the internet that most of you were first introduced to um, if you are in a similar generation to myself. In 2005, that's where we saw the implementation of social media and so that's also kind of where the web 2 comes in. And then we have round 2018, maybe even 2017, some people might say, uh, we have the emergence of Web 3.0, and where that will go is still a question at the moment, yeah? So to explain a little bit further, um, you have Web 1, which is considered kind of this information economy, and it's a read-only sort of web interaction. And so you just have these static web pages uh, and it's where people go to consume content. So think about going to a Google search engine, reading your news on MSN or Yahoo. Uh, and if you want to know, okay, what kind of web am I actually interacting with right now? Uh, usually the login is what tips you off. And so if you're logging in with your email and a password, it's likely that you're using a web 1.0. Looking into Web 2.0, that's where we have the platform economy, and that's where you actually read and write. And so as opposed to just being consumers of content, you're also creating content. And this is where social media comes into play. So for example, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, where not only are you able to consume that material, you're also able to create your own, upload it, share it with others. 
if you want to know if you're using Web 2.0, uh, the logins are typically, um, so even if you're on a website, sometimes they might even offer you to log in with your social accounts as opposed to your email and password. And that would be a Web 2.0 version. Then looking into Web 3, that's what some deem as the token economy. Uh, and that's where you read, write, and then also execute. And so you actually have a little bit more power as the consumer. So the people or the consumers actually control the ownership of their data. And it's actually through decentralization, which we'll get into a little bit more later. Examples of this are Bitcoin, which I'm sure many of you have heard of, or perhaps you've heard of Diaspora uh, or OpenSea. Uh, if you want to know if you're using a Web3 platform, uh, when you log in, usually you're connecting directly with some sort of wallet as opposed to your social media accounts or your email and password. How am I doing so far, Daniel and David? Am I on the right track? Yes, absolutely. Okay, fantastic. <laughs> so a little bit more on Web3 and looking at its underlying technology or more specifically looking at blockchain. Uh, so we have blockchain here and it's a method of storing data online. That's kind of the simplest way that we can break it down. Uh, it's a distributed decentralized database and it's managed by network participants. Uh, so Web3 actually relies on the blockchain stack technologies. And so you actually have three different layers that we're going to look at very briefly as well. And so when you have these layers, it helps Web3 be decentralized. And that means that it's not, for example, regulated by the government or another organization that's trying to get money from it. Uh, and so users actually engage in direct peer-to-peer -peer transactions as opposed to having a central authority or a middleman. So what are these layers and what is it that they do in Web3 or within the blockchain? Uh, so with layer one, this is the foundation. This is where we're starting. Uh, and that's uh, what makes it operate, allowing for these different platforms to emerge. Uh, and so that includes a complex network, infrastructure, as well as hardware and connections. Uh, and a nice note here that Daniel has put in is that for an infrastructure startup, a founder may need to work at this L1 level. Uh, and so it would also be the case if you plan to create your own token or cryptocurrency, this is where you really need to start and focus on. With layer two, uh, there are solutions here are involved uh, that aim to improve the performance and efficiency of the underlying infrastructure that you then have. So through that, you also have this, what. Daniel is calling the blockchain trilemma, where you have scalability, decentralization, and security that's all coming together. And the goal here is to increase transaction speed and transaction throughput. Uh, so how many transactions you can have per second then. And then we have layer three here, which is also known as the application layer. And that's where you find the decentralized apps or also known as dApps like Bitcoin and OpenSea, really these other names that you've heard around, that's that final layer actually that you're looking at. And much of this development has been within areas like NFTs, the non-fungible tokens, uh, gaming and DeFi, which is decentralized finance. So um, what I may can add, uh, Ashley, what you've just said about the layer two, especially, and the so-called blockchain dilemma um, that we uh, know from uh, the use case of Ethereum. Ethereum is the second largest um, capitalized uh, uh, cryptocurrency in the market. I guess most of you might know that. And so this, this term or this, 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 this concept was coined by the founder, uh, Vitalik Buterin of the Ethereum this blockchain dilemma and he's pointing out basically i may can give you an analogy to make this uh, more like concrete or let you understand it's it's about optimizing or finding the right balance between your your job your social your social life and finding the right time to have a good sleep so now if you have like a lot of work and have a lot of social activities sleep might go bad. And this is like the case with this blockchain dilemma. So 
So how can you, like, if you will reframe it in a question, how can you provide a, a, a highly scalable uh, a blockchain infrastructure or platform uh, which has a, a, a decentralized uh, characteristic and is also secure? Because if you consider if the blockchain or like the network is growing, more participants are coming, which means also it gains popularity and, <clears throat> and hackers might get attracted. Uh, so you can see how all these factors come together and finding the right equilibrium is uh, yeah, the art basically. Mm -hmm. I, I, if I could also add too, just a, a point of distinction here, we're looking at specifically at the comment around startups in the space, right? Specifically noting that this is limited here, this notion of, of layer one being, you know, that's where startup is referenced here. True if it's an infrastructure startup, right? If you're a startup that is looking to create your own network distinct from these other things, you're creating your own you know, permission or permissionless blockchain, yes. But I don't actually think that that, I don't want that to be limited in people's minds as the area of growth right now, because I don't think it is at all. I think the vast majority of growth, at least that I'm seeing, is going to be at the, the application layer. In the same way you saw in the evolution of Web2, you, know, you saw an explosion in the growth of app developers once there was this common marketplace this very uh, succinct and effective way of accessing the internet via Apple products, right? And the Apple uh, app store, then all of a sudden it exploded in startups, all building things to access via that, you know, you could think of it like a layer two to access the layer one of the internet itself, right? Think about that as an analog. It's obviously technically for any developers in the in the room, don't, don't throw sticks at me because it's not a direct analog. But in terms of thinking about it from an industry perspective and from a use case perspective, I think it's a pretty strong comparison to what you're seeing of what is underpinning all of this, how do you access it, and then how do you utilize the fact that you can access it? Yeah, that's a very good point. And I think we're also going to get a little bit more into that, how we can actually utilize this technology for our own purposes, whether it's startups, entrepreneurs, or somebody trying to take their business a little bit more into the digital world then. Uh, I think really just the next couple slides are also more um, helping us go in that direction. Uh, and so this is also some questions that maybe a potential entrepreneur should consider. Uh, do you want to build an application? So are you looking to go for that app? Uh, do you want to build up a platform? Are you going to help encourage then other apps come from it? Uh, or do you want to build that infrastructure? Do you want to have that base level for yourself, for your company, and then add everything up on top of that? There's also a nice glossary here that Daniel has put together. I've colored it because I find that that helps distinguish everything here. We're going to talk a little bit about more decentralization for sure and DeFi, uh, DeFi or decentralized finance. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit more about NFTs too that's going to come into the conversation. Feel free to take a screenshot. I'm also happy to send this around later for anybody looking to have a glossary of such terms. Yeah. For now, I'm going to stop my screen share, though. I would like to transition this then into a bit of a discussion then. So we've gotten into these layers and some examples of them. Um, maybe we could bridge over into some uh, kind of practical use cases and how, how people can actually implement this or what people are doing nowadays. Or why is it important to be decentralized? Will that actually work? These are some very big questions. I'm happy to start if you'd like, and maybe just take a, take, take, take a piece of it and maybe um, work working backwards. And you know, why is it important to be decentralized and um, whether projects are decentralized, I think is also a really big question. So going back to the, the, the fundamental kind of value add of, of, of working in a blockchain-based environment is the idea of non-reliance on a centralized intermediary, not non-reliance on a centralized arbiter of truth. How do you achieve that? We, we, we go through you know, the processes that lead us here of saying, oh, this is a, a mechanism by which, by moving our notion of truth into an extended network, it undermines the ability of any individual bad actor or 
self-interested actor. It doesn't necessarily be bad. You know, to make sure we're not saying that it's inherently criminal. Just somebody working in their own self-interest cannot undermine the, the collective notion of truth. There's no single source of truth. Very powerful thing, and it, and it, it very much you know changes um, you know the way that we think about data, about truth, about verification in a digital space. But not everything needs to be that, and not everything wants to be that. It takes a lot of work to be doing things that rely on a consensus mechanism. So you can have things like a private blockchain. A private blockchain is not truly decentralized, right? By its very nature, you have one or a limited number of, of intermediaries, of authority sources that can you know, affect who is able to participate in, in this network. Now, is it still a blockchain? Yes, you do have multiple nodes, you, you have the verification process, you have all of these things, you have your you know, complete source of, uh, of what has happened on the blockchain on each of these different nodes verifying it. But at the end of the day, because you have a permission mechanism, it's not decentralized. Now, is that bad? No, it's just different, right? You know, the, the question then is, okay, what part of this are you leveraging then? Well, then you're perhaps leveraging this immutability facet of it or the pseudo immutability, you know, taking into consideration that hard forks are a thing. You're just approaching this solution, leveraging its upside in a different way. And so I think that's an important thing where, you know, whenever there's exciting new technology, everyone wants to then embrace it for whatever their use case is. And like, okay, yeah, we're, we're all gonna be, you know, blockchain based, you know, we're all gonna be, you know, AI based now. Um, and it's not, not always the case, and, but there, it doesn't mean that we throw all of it out. We just get better and better at saying, in what situations is this appropriate? In which situations, um, maybe this isn't a solution that's adding as much value as it is adding effort. Yeah, exactly. So uh, I can only agree with uh, you, David. And so from, from an overall perspective, just to reframe also what David said, um, blockchain helps a lot to like um, pushes down transaction costs. Like this is like, in my opinion, the 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 value added the blockchain may uh, yeah is like uh, uh, delivering. Besides also other uh, aspects like, for example, transparency. If you may think. Um, there is a there is a company in Germany which is called BlockX, and this company provides you or like supports you in in the, in in the whole manage uh, contract management process. That is by like the creation, negotiation, adjustment, and also signing the contract, which is all happening on the blockchain. What is the advantage? People can like see the data transparently, and then a lot of paperwork also diminishes. That is also then also leading to the, to the advantage that uh, um, we have like lower transaction costs. Uh, and this, as you can like then see clearly, when you have like lower costs, lower time consuming uh, activities. You might can also dedicate yourself to other activities and the overall uh, value added like increases. So I'm talking more on a high level, but then yeah, sure, all these things have to be uh, uh, decided individually from company to company. And uh, yeah. And with that being said, with it being so individualized, who would you say actually needs blockchain for, for their business to, to function? Why, why would they consider using these functions of, of Web3 within their business? What are the then advantages for them? Yeah, I think they're looking, digging into a particular use case, Eric has a question in, in the chat. He's asking, um, you know, do you see any value in the often discussed smart contracts? Okay, that's a, that's a good way to kind of narrow it in terms of, you know, who can see value in, in blockchain at all? Let's just talk about what a smart, first, what a smart contract is, what it isn't, and like what kind of use cases might be well served by the utilization of this kind of thing. So, you know, a, 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 a quote unquote smart contract is going to be just a self executing program on, on the blockchain, right? If you have, if input A is, 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 is satisfied, then, then, then output B, right? Or input A and output B equals 
or input A and B equals output C, something to that effect, right? It's a pretty straightforward thing. Uh, so what is it? It's automatic. What is it not, potentially? Might not be a contract. There's actually um, some question academically whether or not this actually constitutes a contract, depending on what law you're governing and law you're under. And in the, in the, the, the English and US common law, in order to have a contract, you have to have um, offer, an offer, acceptance, consideration, um, and oftentimes this sort of fourth nebulous factor of a meeting of the minds, a common <laughs> understanding of, of what the, the fundamental terms of the agreement are. And by the nature of the disparity of the understanding of the interface that's common in the creator versus the executor of a smart contract, that might be at odds. But, you know, come attend my <laughs> lecture at the law school if you want to dig into the, 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 the theory of whether this applies in, in a contractual sense. But looking at practically, when does this make sense? It, when something being automatic makes sense. Um, what would be an example of that? Arbitrage. This is very good for arbitrage. Where you have an, a situation where you're trying to buy and sell things, you're trying to make transactions at predefined points. This is a very good use. It, 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 it's very um, consistent. It's very stable. Uh, if you are the creator who has the access to the contract to uh, 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 to adjust these um, uh, points of, of, of inflection, it, it's, a, it's a wonderful use case for that. I've seen it used in other ways that are less helpful, trying to reach um, multifaceted agreements, trying to use it as a traditional legal contract is, is often a poor use case for it, despite the name ascribed to it. Um, Delivery of something is is a very um, you know perhaps delivery of of access to information would be one way of doing it. If you have this access code, if you have this resource, and you are able to present it to the contract, the contract then grants you entry. That's that's a really fun and interesting way of doing it without having to rely on that uh, being hosted in, in in on a centralized server, for example. So you know those are ways that that it, it can be leveraged within the greater context of, of kind of a Web3 thing. And then, but the, oftentimes the question will become, and we'll get to this, I'm sure at some point is, you know, how do people who are new to this technology gain access to these things when they are not themselves, you know, Web3 persons, right? And these are not necessarily user interfaces that are at this point, particularly user-friendly for the lay person. So is, something like a smart contract that's presented and only accessible via the current interfacing we're able to interface with smart contracts, actually a really great way of getting to your average user, maybe not until the layer three applications are at a point where the, the UI UX experience comes together in a way that circumvents the need for web two, or perhaps it's just gonna be the interplay between a web two interface access, the, the, a web three um, end result. I think that's also a very good point about accessibility, David, just in general, uh, because when you're looking at Web3 and if it is something that you're not able to comprehend or you don't quite trust, maybe, I think that's also a big question that comes from, from people who are not that involved uh, with these technologies at all, is that, is it something that I can trust? Is it someplace where I'm going to get taken advantage of? Uh, is this secure for me then as, as as a person who seems to be seemingly an outsider then? And then I, I guess my question then wrapped up in that is that how do you actually build trust within these supposedly trustless then networks uh, that, that are being built? Might be more of a philosophical question at this point though. <laughs> no, I mean, and, and, and it is, I mean, the distinction between a decentralized cent, uh, truth center versus a centralized truth center is what are you willing to trust? Are you willing to trust the centralized intermediary? In that case, just use a centralized intermediary. It's probably going to be easier, right? For a long, long time, people will be like, well, I trust my banks, so it's not a problem. You ask people globally now how much they trust their financial institutions, and that trust has been eroded. And so you think, well, how can we escape 
relying on a centralized intermediary that we don't have faith in, let's create a system. We're going to create a system that is transparent in its flaws, in its strengths. Anyone can look at this. Anyone can ask a question. Anyone can form an inquiry. And through transparency and then consistency in delivering the result that's promised, that's how trust has been built in, in things like, look, look like, you know, Bitcoin Core, right? Like you're looking at Bitcoin Core at this point and your ability to interface on that blockchain, it has shown time and time again that it is very difficult, if nay impossible, to, to hack that network at this point based on you know what it said that it's going to do and how it said it's going to do it. It's followed through. And now it's extremely trusted. Um, Ethereum for a long time, you know, kind of this sort of the iterative you know, example of a very similar blockchain with a very similar consensus mechanism has now moved to a different consensus mechanism that has its own set of challenges in terms of developing true long-term trust to it. As you've moved from proof of work to proof of stake and you know, different consensus mechanisms will continue to come, come along as we figure out how best to balance um, scalability, efficacy, um, and, you know, and those two will be at odds with one another all the time. But that's how you build trust is, you know, be transparent, and then do what you say you're going to do. And if you do those two things, you end up trusting the system and you don't need to trust any individual actor anymore. So, and, and maybe also not, not regarding the question, which was asked by Eric, if smart contracts are like, yeah, uh, where is it kind of? Uh, uh, so what is also happening now more and more, uh, companies are emerging that, specifically uh, have the goal to audit, to audit these smart contracts. Because you may have to consider, as David explained, those are like smart scripts. So in these program scripts, there might be bugs or anything similar, which might like, yeah, be make it easy for hackers to hack your network. And that's why also like these uh, companies start emerging and there you can also see how, how what popularity they gain that's a good point you know the the rise of third party service providers who either for a fee or just because of their engagement with the community provide you know the the synthesis or the analysis of of a given network smart contract, et cetera, because despite the fact that this information is oftentimes publicly available, it's only available pe to people who, one, know how to find it and see it, and then two, know how to read it, and then three, know how to actually extrapolate from what they read. Um, it's because these are very literally their own languages. And unless you can read that language and further beyond simply reading it, you know what would, what would happen to me if I was pressed on this call to you know, read something in German. One, it would be extremely awkward and I would do a poor job. Two, even if I was able to struggle through saying the words, my ability to philosophize and truly extrapolate the value that was being conveyed in those words, unlikely, extremely unlikely. And the same thing will happen if somebody's trying to read, you know, Bitcoin Core, someone's trying to read Solidity on an Ethereum, you know, smart contract unless you can read those things and read them at a level where you're able to extrapolate um, a deeper meaning, it's difficult to, to even have anything. So having third party service providers who are you know, doing this for, for a fee sometimes, you know, we, we will do that for someone for a fee, um, uh, or people who are simply participating in the community of saying, hey, there's new projects out, we reviewed the project, this is what we think about it. You know, th those are the way that, you know, again, lay people could try to get some degree of, of affirmation. I think Eric has added a little bit more. He says he would wager that neither David nor any other attorney would want to draft uh, draft of any other contracts to be immutable. No, I mean that that's another good point, and it and it, and it brings up a good um, distinction here uh, as to what is immutable on the blockchain. The results, the transactions, are what are are immutable, right? And and that's an important thing when thinking about blockchain and thinking about use cases. Blockchains are in the business of tracking transactions. 
If you're doing something that is not transactional, moving something from here to there, you're just you've you've failed the initial litmus test. Move on. It's never going to be the best use case for you. There has to be something fundamentally transactional in it, or it's just not the right technology. So going to the contract piece of it and attorneys, you know, the number of attorneys who are willing to engage in a contract that will then be in a space that can then be interacted with, with anybody who can find it, that's going to require a degree of diligence on the part of counsel and further finding counsel who is able to even literally write the code that was we, we required for that. It, it, there's also it'll be a pretty short list. There's not a lot of people in the world who can do both of those things. And so that's another disconnect, I think, when it comes to the adoption of things like self-executing uh, self smart contracts is that they're going to either be drafted by developers and then reviewed by lawyers who have only been told ostensibly what it does and then extrapolated legally, or the inverse. They'll see something from a lawyer who says, I want it to do this, and then a developer will tell them, indeed, I have set it up to do that. There can be a disconnect there, right? To make sure that everyone's on the same page and embracing all the nuances of that back and forth is very difficult. And so you end up being in a position where, okay, in order to do this the way I want to do it, I need to find a lawyer who is also a developer. And now you found yourself looking through a very, very short list of people who are going to charge you a lot of money. And it might then undermine the entire business use case where if you're being charged this much money to do this thing, I guess I'll just send people an email instead. Right. And then that's where the innovation for innovation's sake versus finding a true use case that's going to create business relevant value. OK, thanks. And then we did also get a question through the Q&A function here uh, from Elefateria, and uh, it's actually Back to the question of the layers, layer one, two, and three, and she asked um, if the following analogy for layers would be sufficient. Uh, if you say that layer one is like the ecosystem, layer two is like the marketplace, and layer three is then like the business that you would have from that. So... Yeah, like layer one is yeah the infrastructure where where the, the whole like yeah this is like described in the right way. Uh, layer two rather aims to um, solve this issue that uh, I mentioned, uh, also regarding scalability. No, uh, especially if we want to attract more members or participants to a network, how can we like make it work in? most like in an efficient way so this layer two like rather aims like it's similar to the layer one but we still like we are just uh, basically providing a platform yeah in which then people can build like yeah apps mm -hmm. decentralized app in the layer three so well, we make an then, then maybe the um layer layer one if that's kind of the ecosystem or infrastructure and then layer two is more more like market research as opposed to the marketplace, since you're trying to solve these these issues, right? I think she's trying to do a business analogy with the the layers. Business analogy, yeah. We may can think of as a platform, like uh, like uh, Apple, or from Google, uh, from yeah, from Google, Android, those platforms, and then people can use it to start building or developing their apps on this platform. So if you if you think about if if if, if also a layer one uh, like a, a, a company which focuses on layer one, they are also going to build a platform in which they try to also develop their own apps to see if it works working. So yeah, you have to also set up a proof of concept so that people then also can use when you make a roll up. Yes, thanks. Okay, um, and uh, so if we're going to take this and also bring it to that analogy level or to kind of a practical level of seeing how this actually functions in practice, uh, 
is is there something that you guys could relate this to so having a decentralized network and what that means um what are the practical implications of that then what are the benefits that they have i know when we were discussing very briefly this um last week when we got together david you made the analogy of this whole decentralized force and talking about the um marijuana industry in the us and uh having how that's now trying to be deregulated and how that's working for the industry would you like to say more to that effect Sorry, I, I think my connection bugged there for a second, so I missed part of the question. Uh, I was I was saying that since we we talked about this last week with decentralization and then also how it relates to other areas of life, and you made the analogy or the connection with the marijuana industry and how it's being decentralized or deregulated in in the U.S. and how it's working for the marketplace in in that sense, and how that can then also be related to this blockchain and, and Web three decentralization as well. Sure, I mean if we're just taking a step back and just looking at the regulatory and legal landscape for Web3 participants and entrepreneurs and investors, uh, I think that that's where the analogy is the strongest industry-wise in terms of where the, the cannabis industry has been uh, in the last 15 to 20 years versus where it is now, where you, you know, despite seeing significant progress towards a um, adoption of a regulatory regime that allows for entrepreneurs to, to function and to, to do their business, you see an inherent disconnect still in the United States between federal or national law and then state or more local laws. So individual states in the United States have the ability to their mind to, to um, decriminalize and, and, in, and affirmatively regulate and tax cannabis, either recreationally or medicinally. Um, you Sometimes you see a combination of the two and they have their own regulatory regimes, but that exists only within that state. At the federal level in the United States, it's still deemed an illegal drug. And so you can have a situation where um, there are inherent strange tensions where, for example, a completely legal cannabis company in the state of California, where cannabis is legal, can't get a bank account from a nationally chartered bank in the United States because the bank cannot do business with people who are openly doing crimes. And according to federal law, which is the relevant law for a federally chartered bank, that prospective client is doing crimes. And so they have to operate in strange ways because they can't get a credit card because in order to have a credit card, you need to have an associated federally chartered bank, nationally chartered bank that is backing that, that card, accepting those transactions. And so if you're looking at the evolution of regulatory landscape in the United States, you're seeing a similar patchwork emerge where you have states like Wyoming, um, Ohio to a degree, um, being more and more welcoming to the development in the Web3 space. You see others like New York being um, much more conservative in their posture. Uh, and at the same time, overlaying all of it, you have the federal government who you know, to a degree has been providing some some guidance, but it's still a bit of a patchwork and it's a bit of a tug of war between regulatory agencies at the federal level in the United States, deciding who is the primary regulator with oversight over the space. Is it Gary Gensler's SEC? Is it the CFTC? Is it uh, the Office of Foreign Asset Control, OFAC, under in, within the Department of the Treasury? Each one is putting themselves out there as the the default regulator that others should surround um, for purposes of, of creating clarity, but but there's no, pardon the pun, consensus as it relates to, 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 to where that is. And so that's part of the difficulty of operating in the United States is navigating that patchwork. And, you know, if we come over, you know, to the EU, you know, Mika is being kicked around and, you know, it, there seems to be a degree of understanding of what that framework will ultimately look like, but it's not there yet, and there's no guarantee it ever will be adopted and provide consistency there. And then there's the fact that by the nature of these um, protocols, by the nature of these applications, they're international. So how are they going to play and function and operate 
in a world that has such disparate um, appetites for engaging with the technology, because it's going to be very different if you are in um, you know, Germany or in the United States or in Dubai or in Panama. Each of these places is going to be treating it very differently. And so that's one of the, the challenges that, that entrepreneurs and investors face when working in this space is there are a lot of laws. They are not necessarily consistent. Which ones am I needing to follow? And how do I follow them in a way that isn't so cost ineffective that it defeats the project altogether? Right, and and then to that, we had an, another question that's come through about um, as an American living in Germany, they've noticed that with the GDPR and all the data protection regulations then here in Germany, they find that oftentimes it kind of holds back some German in industry or holds back the entrepreneurs from being able to participate in such things uh, just because there are such strict regulations. Uh, I don't know if maybe, Daniel, if you could speak to that, if you know more about that or... Um, Yeah, so so I, I I completely agree with that. So regulations are pretty tough here regarding data privacy, and uh, seeing that there is also no uh, standardized framework, as uh, David said, with Mika, uh, you know, you are better off to like uh, uh, maybe like follow the strategy to go and 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 uh, uh, start your startup in, in Liechtenstein or in Switzerland or in Malta, you know, those countries are really like pretty advanced and, and in terms of like uh, laws and standards because they have already uh, such frameworks that you can use and uh, regulations are also not that strict. But here, yeah, it's, it's, it's still a big uh, um, obstacle. And but if you still want to like do it in Germany, it's highly recommended to work with an attorney like David. But yeah, find it here in Germany. That's another issue. And uh, yeah, so it's difficult. I can say yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I'll, I'll I'll follow up with that, saying that it's difficult but not necessarily impossible. And uh, I I run into this oftentimes with prospective clients who are trying to structure their business in a way such as to just avoid regulation altogether. Well, what if I'm in the Seychelles? What if I'm in the British Virgin Islands? What if I'm in Panama? Um, what if I'm in Liechtenstein? Um, you know, my answer is going to be, yeah, but where are your users? Where is your capital? Right, like you're probably going to touch these jurisdictions regardless. So let's have a conversation about how can we navigate this process. The privacy law one is a really good one. I work with U.S. companies all the time. I'm a U.S.-based attorney. We build privacy policies that comport with European law consistently. That is the baseline. If you were my client and we were building a privacy policy for you, it's going to try to reach two specific standards: European law and the state of California. Why? Because the Europeans and the Californians have the most stringent privacy law possible. And if you meet that standard, you're good everywhere else, right? And so there's an upside to choosing the most onerous jurisdiction, using that as your standard, and then having a degree of freedom inherent to I'm meeting the highest standard possible. The chance of me running afoul of privacy law in Costa Rica or Australia now is going to be lower because I've gone ahead and embraced the policies and the practices that are at the most stringent level. So that's that's one way that I, I suggest engaging with the problem solving of structuring your project and structuring your company. And sometimes some people forget, like they want to build these products, these projects, these 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 services. And it's like, well, at the end of the day, it needs to be a company too. Where will it be formed? Yes, but where are you? <laughs> where are your customers? Where are your investors? Where are your end users? Where all of these things need to be taken into account as you strategize. And it can be a lot to take on up front, but my, my, my advice is oftentimes take the time and or to, to either A, have those conversations now, or take the time to raise a little bit more seed money 
to have those conversations now, right? Because you'll find lawyers who work with startup companies in your industry who are going to be sensitive to the realities of your financial situation, being an early stage company, who will work with you to, to, to accommodate that and put you on good footing because long-term, I'm speaking as a lawyer, right? I don't make a lot of money off of brand new startup companies. And I don't want to, that's, that doesn't make any sense. I'm trying to squeeze water from a stone. What that does though, is I develop an early relationship with ambitious and smart professionals who are hopefully building something amazing. And if I can help them lay a solid foundation when they have the question that does require more work and will frankly make me more money, they're gonna come back to me. They know me, they trust me. I've been a part of their team for a long time. That's an, it's an investment on my part to work with early stage companies. And it's one that I enjoy doing because these are people who are excited, who are enthusiastic about what they're building. And so that's another part of it as you navigate this is different professionals build their businesses differently. And so for someone like me, working with early stage companies is part of my business model. It's a conscious decision that I've made to invest in my clients with the expectation that we're building a long-term relationship. That's a wise decision on your part as well. Amazing. There should be more people like David having this <laughs> attitude, this mindset. It's amazing. Uh, Daniel, there's a question that came in for, for you in the chat. Um, do you see business use for internal or private blockchains? Uh, so either now or in the future? Yeah, for sure. Private blockchain. If you just think about companies or insurance companies, and also here the use case of like or the location of Germany in which we have this uh, data privacy issue, those private blockchains are good for those companies, for those use cases. And if you just think about private, uh, uh, data is not public, publicly available. So um, that's, yeah, in favor. So if you, if you just think all about where you have this data privacy rules in all these industries, block, private blockchain is like perfect fit for that, definitely. So, uh, but then as, 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 as David mentioned beforehand, we are not in a decentralized world, we're still in a centralized world. Yeah, but yeah. Definitely in that direction. And maybe uh, another question for, for you, Daniel, as well. Um, is accepting cryptocurrencies actually profitable for a business? Uh, what is it that you need to know before you actually consider adding them to your practice if you're looking to accept them? So... If I consider this as an economist, and we, we economists, we like to consider all these risks that inherent such an asset, right? And like the, the most like uh, most difficult part, I can say about these crypto assets are uh, the, the the volatility, right? So, and I've also read a couple of uh, like like there are research papers about that, and 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 when i was like working in switzerland and like we had like interviews with uh, experts from some companies that were to adopt uh, 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 like uh, payments that you could like pay via bitcoins but many of them were just reluctant due to the reason of like um yeah finding the right uh, transaction mechanism like for example some something like paypal that you can use to, to transact those Bitcoins and uh, the volatility. So those two points were like, yeah, in favor of like, hmm, we should think about it. We are like rather uh, doing it slowly with adoption, accepting Bitcoins or like cryptocurrencies in general. Okay, it looks like that there are some people heading off for, for dinner now. And so um, we'll, we'll see if any of the questions come in at this time. But I think I would ask um, each of you, Daniel and, and David, if there's one thing that somebody should take away just knowing from, from today, maybe your one top piece of advice for somebody looking to either implement uh, 
if they're looking to get into the Web3 sphere or if they're looking to add blockchain technology to their business or if they're looking to accept cryptocurrencies, maybe you can each get, just give one little piece of advice in some direction to everybody. I know it's hard to generalize since these are quite specific things. Uh, yeah, then I can start. So um, my advice is like, if you are interested in that topic, I guess all of you uh, who are here now watching us and read, read a lot about it, get an idea, because most of times I can also see in the current business or like in my current job position when I'm, when I'm, when I'm dealing with like these higher managers and trying to sell them a, a business intelligence solution, for example, they don't have an idea of, of, of its potential, of the power, because you, you need to find the proper use case, figure out the proper or identify a proper use case, and then try to like think, ask yourself, is my idea having an impact? Do, do I create an, a value added? Like, like, yeah, just ask these simple questions. And if you can like answer them, go for it. And then you may also like find people like David who have this nice mindset and support you. Yeah, so that's from my side. Oh, well said. Does my idea make an impact? Does it have value? Is there an added value to it that I'm bringing? Yeah. Well, I'm gonna and I'm gonna echo part of what Daniel said of, of, about reading. Like self edification is so empowering in so many ways. Obviously, everyone who's here believes in that. You know, no one's required to be at this 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 talk tonight, right? You you chose to be here to learn something and taking that and leveraging it. You know, I'll I'll, I'll self plug. I'll do that. You know, I I realize and I'll, I'll put this in the in the chat for everybody. You know. I, in order to do what I do, in order to practice the way that I practice, I have to read legal updates in the space every day. And every day, part of the way my brain works, the easiest way for me to read is to write, right? So I'll read something and I'll synthesize it at the same time. At some point, somebody said, you should probably share those, right? Like, there's no reason that you have a folder full of your musings on legal developments and nobody else reads them other than you. I'm like, oh, maybe I'll do that, right? And so this is just one example of somebody who works in this space who is putting out content, which I hope is useful to people and been derelict in, in my content creation in the last month or so since um, having a, a new baby at home, but intend to get back on board with that. And so th there are lots of people out there. And if you find people that you appreciate their perspective and you trust their you know sort of way of approaching the issue, this should be pretty digestible content and to kind of self edify. And then you're able to do even better what Daniel so you know eloquently suggested of asking yourself these questions about your ideas. And, you know, so going from self edifying to self analyzing, and then you'll be in a good position to know who you want to reach out to to have an additional conversation. And, and that, that'll set you up for success, hopefully. Excellent. Well, well said. And do check out David's Substack. Uh, there was one more question that came through. Does the right to be forgotten conflict in any way with information being stored on the blockchain? Good question. Yeah, I think it's a, a, a great question. And, and you know, that would be like the, the going back to the early, early, the earliest slide, right? Looking at you know what is the the, are the rights here and maybe it's going to be the transition over to to, to web four is you know the right to to going from execution to to ownership the right to own your data you go from being able to read data to produce data um you know to execute data perhaps and then ultimately to own your own data and own your own digital identity um may very well be be the future of it part of the notion of 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 of, of the pseudo anonymous reality of blockchain, hopefully to a degree undermines that, right? The immutability and the fact that these transactions are stored ad infinitum on the blockchain so long as the network exists does to a degree seem at odds with that. The counterpoint being, is there anything to forget if you were never truly known, right? Um, so you, unless you have identified yourself or someone else has identified you and your digital wallet ID, your address in a blockchain, the fact that your transactions are publicly available is, is of no consequence. Um, and you can always restart the generation of a digital identity and a blockchain is 
a, a very easy process of the click of a button, um, the running of a, of a simple script. Um, but I do think it, it harkens to a, a future conversation to be had and a conversation that's being had across this space of, you know, how do we get to a position where the ultimate goal here is people are able to own their digital selves the same way they own their physical autonomous selves. Okay. Well, I think this is probably a good spot to to wrap up. Uh, unless either of you have another closing remark you would like to give, I'll do my own little closing. Nothing for, for me. Thank you very much for, for having me. Daniel, it was a pleasure speaking with you on this panel. And um, anyone same, who's same on here, please me. feel free to reach out. Same, I'm same. so happy that the, the two of you could join us tonight. I'm, I'm happy that we were able to get in touch both through mutual connections. And so that's great. I love being able to broaden our network. Uh, and so if you enjoyed this event and you are looking to broaden your network too while supporting your German American Institute in Freiburg, I encourage you to become a member with us. Like I said, we're a nonprofit organization and we rely on support of our local and our virtual community. Uh, so if you aren't a member yet and are interested in becoming one, you're welcome to visit our website. You can send me an email and we can talk about it. Uh, we do have some upcoming online events that you might be interested in. Um, on May 3rd, I'll have my quarterly lunch break so you can learn while you lunch. It's just a short half hour presentation online. Uh, and then on May 24th, we'll have our English speaking entrepreneurs meeting also online. Uh, and to find out what's happening next, follow us on LinkedIn, sign up for our newsletter if you like, and if you miss an event, be sure to check out our YouTube page for recordings. I would like to thank you and applaud David and Daniel for being here tonight. I know I learned a lot. I feel like those who were here asking questions also learned a lot as well. Many takeaways from this evening. So thank you so much for investing your time, sharing your minds with us. Uh, and I, I hope to see you again either online or in person, same with our participants and same with our streamers tonight. Um, yeah, so enjoy the rest of your evening, everyone, and hopefully see you soon.